Welcome to the Cities Podcast. I'm Brianna Goldberg. I'm standing here in the middle of Cedarvale Ravine. It's early spring, the trees are still bare. The creek is starting to melt a little bit, still mostly ice, but I can see some water rushing underneath. This is a ravine between St. Clair West and Eglinton stations on the subway line. I live nearby, and I live where I do because of this ravine. Because after a day in the core of the city, I can step out of the subway, take a few steps down a hill, and suddenly I'm surrounded by trees and bulrushes and this stream. It's a reminder of what Toronto used to look like before we built a city here. But it's also what Toronto still does look like right now in the giant ravine system. There's nature and concrete and river and lake all woven together. It's actually my first day in the ravine this year because until now it's been held hostage by slippery ice and snow and I've peeked over the Bathurst Bridge a few times to watch its mini glacier start to melt away with this somewhat spring-like weather on the way. But now it's about 10 degrees, it's muddy and it's messy but I can hear the birds and see the creek melting and I can just feel the wildlife and flowers and trees starting to rustle out. It's a new beginning. In the fall, you might have listened to our city's mini-series. It tied into the municipal election, and we talked about traffic and transit and the future of cities. But today, you're walking with me into a new beginning for the podcast. One that's more focused on telling the stories of the city, and one that gets out on streetcars and construction sites and muddy, melty ravines like this, as we explore all the ways Toronto and other cities around the world are changing, growing, and bringing citizens along for the ride. And who better to guide us in these first steps than Toronto's resident flaneur, Sean McAuliffe. He writes about the city for the Toronto Star and Spacing Magazine, and through his Twitter account, which I highly recommend following. It's jam-packed with notes and photos from his explorations. He's authored a few books. One's called The Trouble with Brunch, and the other one is called Stroll. It's about discovering the city on foot. So we'll hear more from McAuliffe a few episodes from now when he talks about how to love a city. But on a day like this, when the city is starting to reveal itself again, I asked him to share a route for a melty spring walk and he ended up taking us in some surprising places. Here is Sean McAuliffe. I think a really fun spring walk to go on is through the ravines. When it's really snowy, you can go deep on snowshoes, which I have, and and you kind of have this weird freedom in the winter with, with something like snowshoes and being much more alone in the city because people are away. But um, there's a really awesome feeling of those first spring walks when you're out there and the rest of the city seems to be out and you're seeing all this bare flesh for the first time in six months. And it's just like overwhelming humanity, which is great. But when you're in the ravines before the leaves bloom, you can see through the forest for the trees. And you can, if you're walking through Rosedale, you can see the back ends of all the the mansions, right, which are totally covered up in the summer with foliage. And so it's like you get this really voyeuristic view of the city just before the leaves come out. And yet it's still warm enough that you could walk for hours and, and be comfortable and, you know, stop in cafes and do all the kind of city things. And so it's like you're comfortable. You don't have to really super bundle up or have gear, um, but you really get to see the city kind of laid bare. And I think most of these, I think I wrote about this once, um, this kind of wonderful voyeuristicness of it. And somebody wrote in to either the star or I, I can't remember where it was, calling me like a, not actually a pervert, but like something in that direction about, uh, you know, like you you peeping Tom, like get out of my backyard. And I'm like, I'm not in your backyard, I'm just looking, right? Because it's there. If you're going to have a conspicuous McMansion, I'm going to look at it and judge it. Uh, but you can do that in, in, in that period. So it's a really kind of, spring is, is a fine time to go for a walk. And it's just really buoyant, I find, like the spirits of Torontonians are buoyant. Like I, I write these things about the winter or tweet these winter walks because winter's not going away. Like it's here, figure out a way to actually enjoy it and not be such a sourpuss about it but there's just this kind of level of like lazy sourpussing around Toronto um, which I think people would be happier if they kind of got over but those spring days when it just busts out like the the kind of joy that you kind of feel walking in the city this kind of ambient joy is effervescent and it's a really wonderful feeling it's almost like it's like Toronto at peak somewhere between April and into June June everything's the foliage is out and so, so there's this kind of like pristine, clean newness to the city and the smells and everything. So it's, it's this kind of wonderful peak. But then you could say this, I could romanticize all the other seasons, but I won't. 
So where would be, if you could um, suggest like, okay, guys, it's, it's time to get out there, go get a coffee at this place, get, get off at this subway stop, get a coffee at this place, start in the ravines here, what would, what would you recommend? I think you should go to Old Mill Station in Etobicoke on the subway, get out. There's not a coffee place right there, so you should bring a coffee with you and go either north or south along the Humber River. South, you go down through the Humber Marshes along the trail, and you end at the, the wonderful white arched bridge at the mouth of the Humber River by the Palace Pier Towers. And you're walking through this really wide expanse of Humber Valley. But then if you go north, the Humber becomes uh, steeper on the sides. There's some great cataracts because you, you, there's a lot of vertical elevation as you go up. And there used to be something like uh, half a dozen mills that use that elevation to kind of do whatever mills do. There's a sort of drama to the landscape that's totally easily accessible by public transit. And then you can walk up and you, you cross under Dundas. Or you could keep going more north. And if you're really intrepid, you go all the way up to Weston. It's an old Ontario town in the middle of the inner ring of Toronto. And you can do that in a few hours. Like you can cover distances if you've never walked through Toronto. You cover way more distance than you think you did. And then you get up and you're on a... Inevitably, there's an arterial road nearby because you're going underneath them. Toronto's a grid. And you get up and there's a bus. And if you don't want to walk all the way back, you just get on the bus and it takes you to a subway. Then to sort of zoom out from there, um, what are some, what is a Toronto issue um, that comes to mind for you that either is in the process of um, an interesting new beginning, sort of we're starting to think about this differently, or that really needs a new beginning, either from a policy perspective or a culture perspective? I think the main thing that needs a new beginning is the idea of Toronto. And I think this is already kind of starting, but getting over this urban-suburban divide, and there are people working towards that. There are differences, and this could be either a 905-416 thing or, or just like downtown Toronto and Scarborough, North York, Etobicoke. And I think these divides have been exploited by people who have something to gain by it politically or otherwise. There's been a void of people talking about shared values. I think there's more shared values than there are differences. Like we're still, this is still just like Southern Ontario, right? It's not that, you know, we're not talking about insurmountable geographic or cultural divides. And and so I think if, if, if we start looking for those connections, and sometimes it's just like when you think about how do you live, maybe some of us drive cars more, maybe some of us walk more, but then... You want your kids to live on a street that's safe. You want probably a library nearby, and you want a good school. Those similarities kind of overlap, and, and they, when you start counting them up, there's just you know dozens and dozens of them that you could kind of point to and exploit for the better. So that I think is the main thing. And we've been amalgamated as a one mega city for now 17 years, and there were people throughout the four years and now still talking about deamalgamation. You can talk about that as a theoretical thing that's going to maybe could happen, but there's no political will to deamalgamate. It would be such a mess. So it's not going to happen, I think, anytime soon or ever, I would say. But other people have different feelings about that. So it's moot. So let's forget about that and figure out ways that we can make this work. And I think it's really important because particularly for downtown people. Downtown Toronto is becoming this kind of Manhattanized, really wealthy place, expensive, hard to... The kind of people that can live downtown is quite limited because it's so expensive down here, and it's increasingly so. So when we start saying, like, let's get rid of the suburbs, let's, let's separate from them, we're different than them, you're basically saying you are different from the part of town that doesn't have the same economic advantage as you do. Um, and these are the parts of towns that are the most ethnically diverse, where the new Canadians kind of land, and where low-income people live, often in towers. That kind of divisive language seems to be kind of rejecting the, the very idea of what Toronto is. So I think if you want to talk about the amalgamation, you have to really redefine what your Toronto is. Do you want like a rich core and a poor separate, you know, kind of outer band? Or do we figure out ways to kind of make this place uh, work together? Sean McAuliffe is author of Stroll from Coach House Books. He writes regularly for the Toronto Star and Spacing Magazine. McAuliffe also teaches two first-year courses at University of Toronto. He takes students on exploratory walks through the city and into city council meetings and generally loops them into all sorts of other urban things. Those first-year courses are offered through University College and Innes College. They're called UC1 and Innes1. 
Thanks so much for being part of this new beginning for the city's podcast. There's a lot more to come, so please subscribe on iTunes or follow us on SoundCloud and keep an eye out for our stories posted on U of T News. If you like this podcast, why not tell a friend who might like it too? You can share the link on Facebook or Twitter or email it or even just tell them with your own human voice. We'd really appreciate it. Because the more city-loving people we invite into this podcast, the more we'll be able to hear about your great stories from the city. Today I'm talking to you from my favorite place in Cedarvale Ravine, but you probably have one too. So get in touch and tell us about your favorite cafes, nooks and crannies and secret stories of the city. Any city, really. You can tweet with the hashtag U of T Cities or send us a note on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. You can also drop me a line at uoftnews at utoronto.ca. Special thanks to our guest, Sean McAuliffe. We'll hear more from him in a few episodes from now. Thanks also to Jay Ferguson for composing the great music you heard in this episode. The City's podcast is produced by me, Brianna Goldberg, with help from U of T News editor, Jennifer Lantier. Thanks for listening.